I won't raise this too high. <laughs> Aloha mai kako, good evening. Um, for the, those who may not know me it, yet, uh, so I do have to raise this a little bit. Uh, for those who may not know me, um, I am Tyler Kahn, Senior Curator of uh, Modern and Contemporary Art here at HOMA. Um, and it is an absolute pleasure to introduce one of the most um, extraordinary, uh, fiercely intelligent, and fabulous people uh, that I know, Dr. Alejandro Rojas. Uh, you'll, if you don't know either of us, you'll see why that's no exaggeration. Um, Alejandra is HOMA's uh, recently appointed works on paper, photography, and new media curatorial fellow. Um, I was in a meeting a few weeks ago with um, our director, Halona Norton Westbrook, who is out of town, <clears throat> um, so couldn't be here this evening. Um, and she was kind enough to say to me, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm really glad Alejandra is here. <laughs> um, originally from Bogota, Colombia, Alejandra was most recently assistant professor of art history at Ohio Wesleyan University. Um, <clears throat> she holds a PhD from Harvard University, as well as a master's from Oxford. Her research, teaching, and curatorial work extend from the early modern period to the present, uh, with scholarly work on representations of the natural world in relation to indigenous, colonial, and contemporary forms of identity. Her current book project, uh, Flora Incognita, Picturing Nature in 16th Century Spanish America, which you'll be getting a taste of this evening, analyzes some of the first images of American nature produced uh, after the conquest. Um, Dr. Rojas Silva has been with the museum for about seven months, uh, during which time I think it is fair to say she has charged up the institution with her deep dive into the collection, as well as deep thinking, about what it means to be an art museum in this place and how we relate to the layered communities around it, including yourselves. So without further ado, uh, Alejandra Rojas Silva. Well, thank you, Tyler, and thank you all of you for wanting to spend a Saturday evening with me. I feel really honored. Um, as Tyler said, I've been here for seven months and I'm just only beginning to grasp the depth of Hawaiian words. While acknowledging that I still have much to learn about Hawaiian concepts, I might make use of one in this introduction. In a recent talk I attended, Dr. Jamaica Osorio said that one of the meanings of aloha is, I see you. So, aloha. <laughs> and thank you for saying aloha and acknowledging and seeing me. A lot of what I will discuss today, although in a very different cultural context, is about visuality, about presenting oneself in the hope of being seen. I would normally just dive into the topic at hand, uh, but after a few months in Hawaii, I've noticed that speakers here tend to locate themselves before they start. I felt a bit self-conscious about doing too much of this. Um, I thought listening to my background would be boring for you all. Uh, but my colleague Susan uh, explained that this is in fact a generous act in which I make myself vulnerable to my audience. She also explained that in this first interaction with me, you might be more interested in learning a little about me rather than just about my scholarly work. So seeing as Susan is very wise, I will take her advice. Um, if you were here for Tyler's talk in February, you might already know some of this, so excuse the repetition. Tyler and I moved here to take positions at HOMA in September and um, we moved here with our 13-year-old son, Teo. We are a multicultural family, and this informs much of the way we exist in the world. Tyler and I met in graduate school, and in many ways share an intellectual axis, 
probably because we were taught by the same people, as was Micah, um, but also because so much of our world together exists in the realm of ideas and art objects. Our scholarly interests, however, are very different. I mostly focus on colonial Latin America and Tyler on global, modern, and contemporary art history. Teo was born in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the child of a Colombian mother and a Californian father. He has lived in Aotearoa, Birmingham, England, Rhode Island, Ohio, and now Hawaii. Never quite belonging to where he is, but also not clearly belonging anywhere else. I grew up in Colombia, and my parents, Fernando Rojas and Alicia Genia Silva, risked their lives and their desire to improve the circumstances of people in Colombia, my father eventually having to leave his native country, but continuing to work for both Colombia and other Latin American countries. My mother, an economist by training, is most often the director of an archaeological museum in Bogota but has also worked as a civil servant, looking after the security of Bogota, a complicated role, as you might imagine. In another time and place, I will happily tell you about how her administration, understanding the role of symbolism, used mimes to effectively teach Bogotanians how to be good citizens. I did not, however, initially follow their activism. That came much later for me but I did follow their interest into academia. So let's get back to flower power. <laughs> I've spent the greatest part of my graduate career thinking about plants. It's a funny thing, really, because I'm a rather careless gardener, if you are to take this by the amount of plants presently alive in my home. Um, but it is also very fitting if you consider the questions I have always gravitated towards. I started my PhD thinking I would work on contemporary Latin American art, especially the work of artists dealing directly with violence. Violence is so widespread in my country's recent history that we have a whole area of study dedicated to it. We call these scholars violentologos, or violence experts. I wrote early essays on the sculpture of artist Doris Salcedo, who abuses furniture in the ways human bodies have been so easily mistreated in the more than half a century Colombian Civil War. These are just two examples of some early projects. Here, everyday objects wordlessly represent absence, pointing at the many disappearances that occurred in the late 20th century. Whether it be closets with leftover clothes filled to the brim with cement or shoes, sometimes not even in pairs, stitched into walls behind barely their parchment. Describing these works, writing about the violence inflicted on objects the way we inflict violence on each other, proved to be challenging for me in my 20s. Um, I thought I didn't have enough distance from it to be able to say anything meaningful, uh, maybe even to understand it beyond my kind of initial visceral reaction. So searching for a way out of violence, um, to find a way through artistic agency to talk about violence, led me to my long-lasting interest in plants. This might seem a little far-fetched, but let me explain myself. Few events have been as violent as the conquest of the Americas. Not only did 90% of the population in the Americas die, but so did whole cultures, languages, histories. One of the major drives for conquest was the search for natural resources. After precious metals, it was green gold, plants, that would provide conquering Europeans with their riches in the early modern period. It was, after all, a search for a spice route that led Columbus on his journey. Throughout their conquest, the categorization of plants was a major interest for the Spanish. We don't often think about it, but categorizing is a form of domination. However subtle, classifying and renaming the American flora and fauna according to European taxonomies, thereby concealing the native use and knowledge necessary to identify the specimens, is a form of colonization. 
The process of integrating American plans into European encyclopedic systems erases local understanding and participation. So the title of this talk has the word resistance in it. But I must admit, this might be a bit of a stretch. The works I examine all function within colonial systems. They are not looking to directly dismantle European systems of knowledge, but I think are working towards reducing European prejudice. The examples I will expand on in this talk are moments when cultures survive erasure, survive the violence of categorization. They show instances in which individuals demand to be recognized in the fullness of their syncretic identities. What do I mean? The artists I will discuss uh, share in both European and American identities. They see power, knowledge, maybe morality, beauty in the land they inhabit, in the plants within that land, and in the people those plants represent. They are examples of people asking to be recognized, asking to be seen. So I feel like I said a lot, um, and very quickly. So let me, instead of just saying these things to you, actually show you how they work in botanical images. I will walk you through two examples. Um, they each occur in heightened moments of change, moments when identities are put to the test. One is the middle of the 16th century, the European Renaissance, early in the colonial period, when Nawa, the group the Aztecs belong to, and Spanish are confronted with the existence of one another, and this realization puts all their systems of knowledge, religion, philosophy, science, morality into question. This happens for both groups, and is interesting in both groups. But in this example, I will only be talking and looking at a Nawa production. I'm calling this section, Whose Paradise? The other will be at the turn between the 18th and the 19th centuries, during the Enlightenment, when the continent is on the verge of revolution. This is right before the independence movements in the Americas. I have called this section Flowers for the Colony, Seeds of Independence, after a long essay I wrote on the subject. Toward the end, I will also mention an example of a contemporary artist in a show uh, I curated of his work called Expedition to New Zealand. So let us start in the 16th century. This is possibly my favorite image from this time. It comes from one of the most beautiful and understated objects produced in the 16th century. This is the central page of the Libelus de Medicinalibus in Dorumerbus, or a short book of medicinal recipes. To make my argument, um, I need to give you a little bit of background about the people who produced this manuscript and why they produced it. In short, this book was created by Martin de la Cruz and translated into Latin by Juan Badiano in the Imperial College of Santa Cruz de Tatelolco in 1552. Tatelolco is just north of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, uh, today, both Tatelolco and Tenochtitlan are part of Mexico City. Santa Cruz was the first school for higher learning in the Americas. The pupils of Tatelolco uh, were drawn entirely from the ranks of the Nahua nobility and were quickly immersed into a European classical curriculum influenced by Erasmus's Christian humanism and pedagogy. Their Franciscan educators taught them Latin grammar, rhetoric, and philosophy. Um, with a view to having them lead their people, the Nahuas, um, into the Christian faith and the civilizing principles it represented, or the Franciscans thought it represented. Aside from Latin, they also spoke Nahuatl and Spanish, and they held positions of privilege in their own culture, and many of them probably were knowledgeable about Mexican pictor pictographic expression. As such, they had the capacity to communicate at the very nexus of Europe and Mexico. Support for the school, which starts in 1536, so uh, Mexico is conquered in 1521, so this is very, very early in colonial times. Support for the school has never been unanimous. The students had a better education than most European people who traveled to the Americas. 
And in this early moment of colonization, not everyone had agreed on the status of the Amerindian people. When the first viceroy of New Spain, which includes Mexico City, who had guaranteed patronage of the school, when he transferred to Peru, there was widespread opposition to the rise of an educated native class and to the continuation of the school. Teachers and students produced this book as a present to the Spanish king in hope for his continued financial support. So in order to talk about this page and include, I'm including three folios uh, when I talk about this image, I could explain why later. Um, as you can see, we have to understand what this object, this present to the king must accomplish. It has to communicate the distinctive achievements of the institution and also how it and its students might serve the king. Why choose a book of municipal recipes? As I mentioned, after gold and silver, plants are the greatest source of treasure. So the choice of gift is clever. How do they show the value of indigenous education? Well, first, you have to show the education itself. The book is uh, written in Latin and follows classical conventions. Um, remember, we are at the height of the Renaissance when classical sources are considered a gold standard. So this little book is full of classical references. Titles, descriptions, and recipes are in Latin. The organization and structure of the book conform to the taxonomy of Dioscorides' herbal, an herbal that had been uh, going around Europe since like the first century after Christ. Plus, the text presupposes the humoral theory of disease inherited from the Greek physician Galen. These pupils know their classical authorities, and they can imitate them quite easily. However, this book is not only a copy of European knowledge. The added value to the king is that it is a book about medicinal plants not readily available in Europe, and includes knowledge of how to use these plants that is also not in Europe not well known in Europe. The herbs listed are all Mexican and their names are in the Nahuatl language, sorry. The images themselves combine European and indigenous representational codes. While depicting individual specimens in line with European convention, the portrayal of flowers is limited, even formulaic, meaning that very few can be identified from the image alone. In contrast, the plant's environments in which um, are rendered with like far more particularity. Aquatic plants, for example, have roots surrounded by blue pigment, are outlined in blue, or emerge from the pictogram for water. Pictograms also indicate when plants grow from rock, like in these two examples. So I will now get to my argument about this image. The blending and conventions that is available throughout the manuscript is also happening in the three folios at the center of the manuscript. These colorful illustrations suggest a symbolic connection between the mythical Mesoamerican city of Tolan and the Christian Garden of Eden. For the Nahuas and other groups in Mesoamerica, Tolan was a myth mythical place of origin. According to early descriptions of Tolan, most of the objects in the city had four and five colors. These central folios of the Libellus feature varieties of plants which are supposed to have flourished in the mythical city and significantly show fruits and flowers growing in four and five different colors. These plants, for instance, are depicted with flowers in which each petal appears in a different color, creating polychromatic patterns at the expense of realism. Sources from the early colonial period for the rise and fall of Tolan describe how, until the rise of a brilliant king, a series of rulers had kept their people in an uncivilized state. But then Quetzalcoatl, feather serpent, led his subjects from nomadism into civilization. Accounts of Tolan describe its people as craftsmen and the markers of civilization include knowledge of agriculture and architecture in stone. Not coincidentally, these match Aristotelian, that is, European definitions of civilization. 
Tolan was such an abundant place that its people, although they knew about agriculture, didn't actually have to spend much time doing it, but could instead dedicate their life to the production of art. The maize was abundant and the cotton grew in multiple colors. Quetzalcoatl's reign of civilization was in part characterized by the multicolor buildings he constructed. Polychromy continued to signify political authority for the Nahuas well after the time of the mythical city. So, if you're with me, the colors refer to Tolan. My argument is a little bit longer though, and it goes to say, not only do they refer to Tolan, but they also refer to the Garden of Eden. Let's look at the image of the Coaxocotl flower, which shows a snake flaking either side of the plant, each biting into a round red flower. Their presence in this image is likely to be symbolic and could have any or all of three possible meanings. One has to do with Quetzalcoatl's snake column temples, the second would be the Caduceus, an emblem of the classical god Mercury, a staff with snakes encircling each other around it, their heads facing each other at the top. That's an example of a Caduceus. This classical reference is appropriate for an herbal because of its association with pharmacy. The third, you might have already thought of. Seeing a snake in on or, or around a fruit garden in a bountiful in a fruit tree in a bountiful garden brings to mind Adam and Eve in the garden prior to the expulsion from paradise. Although the account in the book of Genesis only includes one snake, there are medieval representations showing both Lilith, uh, Adam's earlier wife, and Eve as serpents. Coatl, by the way, the Nahuatl word for serpent, also means twin. <laughs> Some of the additions of the New Testament the students of Tatelolco would have uh, seen included the Caduceus in the frontispiece. Um, there are also significant correspondences between Tolan and Eden as sites of abundance in which principal actors fell from grace after being tempted to overindulge. Let me just tell you a little bit about the fall of Tolan. Sorcerers swayed Quetzalcoatl to get drunk on pulque, the white wine produced from maguey, which leads him to, they say, lose his judgment. He is then persuaded to break his sister's fast by giving her pulque. Quetzalcoatl is filled with sadness and chooses to leave the city and all the advances he has introduced into it, bidding his pages to hide all the riches and all of his possessions. Finally, he takes himself to the ocean and cremates himself in despair. The narrative to be dispelled from this, um, or from Tolan's accounts, has some similarities, of course, to the biblical story of Genesis, in which the serpent led Eve into temptation by inciting her to bite into the forbidden fruit. Then the gendered pairing of Quetzalcoatl and his sister could be seen to correspond to that of Adam and Eve, and the departure of the ruler and his entourage from the abundant city to the expulsion from the Garden of Eden as a consequence of this transgression. The convergences between Christian and Mexican tradition in the Libelus show how members of the indigenous elite could confer a specific character to their beliefs. The vision of Tolan, conveyed by the central folios, was consistent with their Catholic faith and perhaps characterized the Nahuas author's ancestors as participants, at least symbolically, in paradise before the fall. This worked to highlight the extent of indigenous knowledge of nature, while demonstrating its author's ability to synthesize classical, Christian, and Nahua representational codes. The plants here are used to connote the social position of the students of Tatelolco and to suggest that they participate in forms of civilization before the Spaniards came to conquer. Not just civilization, but possibly religion. Okay. Let's now talk about the 18th century and a very different set of people interested in plants. We will now move from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment and from Native Amerindians to Creole Latin Americans. Creoles are American-born people of Spanish descent. 
Although they are not native, they too exist in a colonized space. We will also move geographically from Mexico to Nueva Granada, what is now Colombia, Venezuela, Panama, and um, Ecuador. During the 18th century, the Spanish embarked on three royal botanical expeditions, one to the Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada, you can see the dates there, another to the Viceroyalty of New Spain, and a third to the Viceroyalty of Peru and Chile. I will argue that the images produced to for the Nueva Granada expedition are distinct from those of the other two expeditions. While the Nueva Granada expedition's illustrations are ostensibly in line with an imperialistic logic, and I'll guide you through how that works, their amplified color, detail, and compositional stylization is an aesthetic surplus. They are extra. There is something going on here that shouldn't be happening. And this, I argue, is a rhetorical device that is a patriotic celebration of local Creole identity at the expense of Euro European scientific expansionism. Again, there's a lot of detail to this argument, uh, but I don't want to bore you to tears. So I'm just going to quickly summarize. Uh, let's start with how botanical images support European expansionism. I already mentioned how this worked in the 16th century. Um, in the 18th century, this is even more totalizing and involves even more erasure of local knowledge and participation. This has to do with the Linnaean system of categorization. The Linnaean system will be familiar to you, maybe from school, as it is the basis of scientific names for plants and animals that we still use. So things like genus, species, kingdom. The system was created based on European plants and animals. So under its logic, the whole world, however disparate, had to fit into an organization that was appropriate for European flora and fauna. The three royal expeditions take part in the colonizing enterprise by imposing a Linnaean taxonomy onto flora that already had a native organization and vocabulary. Categorizing plants by their sexual organs, as Linnaeus does, is a choice that allows for them to be removed from their natural environment, since nothing outside the plant itself is necessary for classification. Under this system, the name for genus and species is determined by the person who first claims the plant within the Linnaean order. Plants are often given names in honor of the botanist who first categorized them. Hence, the Muticia clementis that I'm showing you here is named after Jose Celestino Mutis, the leader of the expedition to Nueva Granada. Needless to say, this is not how Creoles in the Americas describe nature. It is not how you describe your garden. Beyond the nomenclature, the names, the images are created in a way that allows the plants represented to seamlessly adhere to European systems and further distance them from their natural environment. This illustration is a good example. What appears to be a straightforward portrayal of a specimen is in fact a highly controlled and idealized representation. The plant is shown as a discrete entity, occupying almost the whole space of the folio. It floats above a blank background. Instead of an interest in the environment, like what we saw in the libellus, what we see is an emphasis on the plant's reproductive organs. That's what you see at the very bottom, those are its anatomies. Thus, readily conveying the information necessary for Linnaean categorization. The lack of roots further disassociates it from the land where it naturally grows. Some illustrations, by the way, do include the roots, but they too are unconnected to any landform. The illustration shows a single plant in, an essential, in all essential stages of maturation one that synthesizes details that are unlikely to be seen together. It's like some kind of cinematic progression from seed to bud to flower. By following European conventions, American flora can be understood, studied, transported, and archived in Europe. This herbal sample of a chinchona contains one large leaf, a medium-sized leaf, and a cut stem, as you can see. The artist wouldn't have even seen the plant in its natural environment. They would have seen this, just herbal samples that a botanist produced. 
And for the image of this plant, the expedition artist extrapolated from the information of the arable. The result is a symmetrical idealization of the plants. Um, sorry. I lost my place. <laughs> um, the result is a symmetrical idealization of the parts of the plant present in the arable sample. Um, I'm going to show you two more examples, um, one with an herbal sample and one without. You can see that the illustrations are composed, are idealizations of a tame, organized nature. Like the logic of the Linnaean system itself, the illustrations disassociate the American plants from their environment and from native understanding, while making the new system appear or feel natural. In short, the Nueva Granada's expeditionary project was a colonizing enterprise. So it is perhaps really surprising that Colombians have honored its leader, Mutis, a Spanish-born man, as a forefather of their independence. A portrait of Mutis housed in the National Museum in Bogotá, for example, shows his bust resting atop a pedestal. Open books and botanical illustrations, along with a celestial globe, lay at his floor. The Muticia Clementis climbs around the pedestal, connecting the signifiers of knowledge with the botanist bust and wrapping both the man and his European totems in local American nature growing from American soil. Mutis was a loyal subject to the crown, and the notion that he is a precursor of the independence is unfounded. The popular Colombian association between Mutis and the revolutionary movement can be partly explained by the timing of the expedition, which coincided with efforts of the Creole elite of Nueva Granada to gain independence from the Spanish Empire. It is true that all of the botanists and several of the artists of the expeditions were directly involved in the independence movement, but not Mutis himself. Creoles were denied access to the highest echelons of colonial power. The independence movement can be understood as an expedient way for them to obtain the power Spaniards were already holding in the Americas. The rationale for denying power to the Creole population varied throughout the centuries and in different viceroyalties, but by the Enlightenment, a Eurocentric racial theory that centered on the inferiority of indigenous peoples of the Americas provided a ready justification. The idea originated with naturalist Georges Lou Leclerc, but took hold in the European imagination with the writings of scientists Comte de Buffon and Cornelius de Pau. Their hypothesis spoused that the humid climate of the Americas was degenerate and it led to smaller, weaker animals, including human beings, making American people inferior to Europeans. De Paz's theories extended to Creoles, and I'm gonna quote him. The Europeans who pass into America degenerate, as do the animals, a proof that the climate is unfavorable to the improvement of either man or animal. The Creoles, descended from European and born in America, have never produced a single book. This degradation of humanity must be imputed to the vitiated qualities of the air stagnated in the immense forest and corrupted by nauseous vapors standing from standing waters and uncultivated grounds. That's the end of that quote. <laughs> so... These ideas seem absurd, but they actually had tangible political consequences for the artists and botanists of the expedition. Creoles, although sharing the same blood as the Spaniards, found it difficult to rise in the ranks of both the administration and the church during colonial rule. So the illustrations of the Nueva Granada, however, display, if not outright revolutionary ideals, at least a really good dose of local pride. This local patriotic inflection is most evident when we compare them to the Nueva Granada artistic production, um, to the illustrations from the other uh, two uh, expeditions. I'm actually going to make this short because it's going a little bit long, but um, the Nueva Granada expedition's illustrations are not drafts for a future print. Uh, I'm showing you a few of like really thousands and thousands of this painstakingly drawn images. Um, it's really hard to describe how 
kind of extraordinary these images are. Um, when you see them in person, just photography takes away half of kind of the beauty of them. The many layers of carefully applied paint has a dimension that makes it appear like the pigment is basically almost floating on the page. Um, I'm gonna compare it to uh, the only uh, images uh, that actually got to their finished product. So these books were created to be published in lavish volumes. They couldn't be because essentially all of the um, America's Revolution interrupted the production, but we have some from the Peruvian and Chilean uh, expedition. And I'm showing you here uh, a finished uh, product from the Chilean expedition and the image that would have kind of uh, illustrated it. Um, as you can see, there's like way less attention played to the like original painting than there is to the finished product. Um, uh, some of the images that are supposed to produce this finished copper plates don't even, they're not even finished, they're not even colored. And the general disregard for tidiness is a characteristic of all the painters who participated in the Peruvian expedition. This detail is a good example of like how careless they were with the coloring. In contrast with the sketchy nature of the Peruvian illustrations, those of the Nueva Granada are intricately detailed with carefully applied tempera colors. The attention to color unnecessarily delayed the process um, of publication. And this is surprising, given that during the Enlightenment, illustration was a matter of contention in regard to the study of botany. Linnaeus himself uh, questioned the usefulness of illustration, given the changeability of nature. So why would Mutis devote a vast amount of the resources of the expedition to the production of delicately detailed illustrations when they were to be transferred to black and white prints? Why wouldn't he work like the Peruvians worked? Another puzzling difference between the Nueva Granada illustrations and those of the other expeditions is that half of the illustration from Mutis's projects are signed. And of these, the most meticulously crafted examples, the most extravagant drawings, those that go beyond mere mechanic, anatomical accuracy to record a dazzling array of colors, are marked with the rubric Americanus Pinxit, American Painter. Because of their beauty, these examples weren't the artists to announce their origin. They are American productions. This excessive color is almost an affront to the strict European Linnaean structure. It turns instead to focus on something Creoles, not Europeans, found significant in their nature. The expedition Creoles artist's attention to color is a direct reaction to European scientific as well as philosophical claims of American inferiority. These illustrations display pride not only in the capacity to paint striking botanical illustrations, but also in the richness and beauty of the flora itself. So some North American Creoles, so people that will eventually be part of the uh, United States, like Charles Wilson Peale, for example, engaged in the scientific dispute by disproving European claims that the American climate did not allow for large animals, showing proof of mastodon bones. Thomas Jefferson tried to disprove Buffon by providing him with a panther skin. The scientists of the Nueva Granada used a different strategy altogether. They responded by calling attention to the aesthetic value of their nature. To counter De Paz's claims that the American climate produces degenerate animals, and among them humans, Caldas, a member of the expedition who dies by firing squad because of his participation in the independence movement, responded by glorifying the flora of his own nature. He questions Prussia's own climate and says whether here the cold can produce the dreams and fancies he, meaning God, invented without warrant or knowledge about the most beautiful and fruitful country in the world, meaning Colombia. The insistence on color beyond any scientific usefulness had a patriotic ring during the turbulent political situation that led to the independence. Europeans blame the environment for Creole inferiority, and Creoles in turn retorted with pride in the continent's natural beauty, 
which they saw as being the result of their climate. So the Nueva Granada expedition's call to wonder, expressed in the images, excess of color and large format, offered a strategy of defiance against the then prevalent notion of American inferiority. Colombian patriotism is so tied to this response that we continue to rely on this defensive strategy. Colombians often have copies of botanical expedition images in their homes. I am one of them. Although all my real plants die, my walls have been adorned with these images uh, at various times. The expedition and its illustration continue to be a sort of shorthand that connects present status to the power of creoles. The image of the botanical expedition hanging in hallways and museums are constant reminders of the aesthetic response that Nueva Granada made to criticisms of inferiority. They are a practice defense against European and more recently Anglo-American perceptions of Colombian subordination. To the reproach that our nation is drug infected, we answer, oh yeah, sure, we have drugs. But have you seen how beautiful our nature is? Wonder remains the answer of Colombians to notions of inferiority. Our national identity from independence onward remains closely tied to the beauty of our natural world. As much as these images are evidence of colonial subjectivity, they also point towards creole self-representation, and they endure as they do because the global power structure under which they were created still echoes. Okay, your troopers, we're almost there. So um, let's quickly touch upon contemporary art. Uh, during my time in Aotearoa, I invited a contemporary Colombian artist to do an exhibition at the Gavit Brewster Art Gallery. Alberto Baraya uh, playfully works with enlightenment attitudes to classifying nature as a form of colonization. He undertakes the role of botanist and collects and catalogs artificial plants exposing the arbitrariness of the Linnaean system and making a parody of their urge to collect and possess while pointing at the global repercussions of their efforts. In this catalog, he photographs artificial plants he encounters in the wild and carefully catalogs them. So he files them under categories like two plants and a chair in the middle, specimen above toilet, one chair and a plant in a reception. Um, yeah. He also produces works that look very much like those from the Royal Botanical Expedition, as you can see on the wall. In this image, he has taken an artificial fern, one of New Zealand's national symbols, and taken it apart, displaying individual parts as Linnaeus would, anatomists of reproductive organs. In his expedition to New Zealand, aside from his usual catalog and Linnaean-inspired anatomies and representations, he also took to the wild and placed artificial plants in the landscape in order to beautify it. New Zealand is often praised for its natural splendor. Tourism and the consumption of beauty often hide the darker side of a colonized land and a displaced native population. These introductions are ways for Baraja to humorously point towards the violence enforced by tourism and colonization. If any of this sparked your interest, we don't actually have in the museum Latin American botanical illustrations at the moment, but we do have one in cross-pollination by uh, Maria Sibila Meriam, one of the only kind of um, female naturalists in the Enlightenment. And although she does operate within this col colonizing structure, she is uh, notable because she was one of the only females. And she's just gorgeous at the way she produces um, insects. And the other one would be Abe uh, Rebecca Louise Law's Awakening. And she is probably the reason I'm talking to you. Because when we first met, uh, she uh, was interested in my work. Um, Rebecca's work speaks of globalization and consumerism. But to me, the most interesting aspect of her work is the dichotomy between beauty and our present existential crisis. Her work delights us with its smells and colors, like Proust Madelines. She brings us back to specific moments and places. But it ultimately points towards the destruction we are bringing on ourselves if we continue to abuse our environment the way we have. That bottom 
um, picture there shows some of the plastic she picked up um, in um, beaches here in Hawaii. Okay, to conclude, this look at botanical illustration through the centuries and its relationship to colonization, power, and agency, um, I hope I was able to capture that flowers and plants are not only beautiful, but they're very serious indeed. Flowers attract and distract, but our representation and use of them in art and science ultimately betrays our most serious concerns. They can encapsulate the whole world order, oppression, abuse, violence, and within that oppression, a will to exist in one's own term, not only to survive conquest, but to give agency to one's people. As a foreigner in Hawaii, I still have much to learn, not least about Hawaiians' relationship to flowers. I want to earn the right to someday understand the encoded meaning of the lay I was so generously offered today. As a curator, I will probably rarely touch upon botanical images. Um, but I hope that my work at home I will tread upon some of the issues discussed here. I hope my exhibitions can help express different people's realities that they show the fullness of syncretic identities, sometimes expressed radically, sometimes subtly. In short, I hope that my exhibitions can say aloha and that they can make you feel seen. Thank you. But I think we might have time for one or two questions if anybody has one. Yes. The document on the left there that was one of the what part from it was produced. Was it finished and sent to Spain to the king? It was. It was sent to Spain to the king. Um, it had kind of a convoluted way. It was sent originally for Charles V, and by the time it arrived in Spain, it was Philip II, which actually works out because Philip II was more interested in botany than Charles was. Um, and then it passed through the hands of various botanists um, and ended up kind of lost. We lost it for centuries. Um, and then in 19... 29, two different scholars found it at the Vatican Library at the same time. Um, and then it was given to Mexico for the uh, quincentenary in 1992. So it's now in the uh, Anthropological Museum in Mexico City. Oh, yes. Yes, please, Amy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Oliver. I have so many questions. <laughs> I think one, I was just curious about um, the pigments. And yes. the relationship of the of what's depicted to the pigment and where the artist got the pigment. I know there are kind of um, corresponding histories of colonial systems of pigmentation and coloring as well. So I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about pigment. Absolutely. So it will be different in the in both uh uh Shows so like the manuscript is basically you is using Nawa Nawa pigments and they did have an incredible amount of color. I don't. There is information on every single pigment. Um, what is true is that like, uh, uh, for example, for all the reds, they're using um, cochineal, um, and red has all of these various significances within um, Nawa culture. Um, in fact. I mean, it's interesting that you ask about pigments because there is a lot of relationship between the plants and the pigments. And often if you if you see a plant, it's either going to have a symbolic representation or if the plant produces that pigment, they will often paint, often paint it in that pigment. Uh, but also pigments were another, we're talking about medicinal plants, but pigments were actually some of the things that gave the most money to Spain. So, for example, every red line produced there is with cochineal, and cochineal is the first uh, um, stable red that Europeans get. Um, so, I don't know if I answered your question. In terms of the of the of the col uh, colonial ones, they're also spending a lot of time 
looking into Amerindian pigments, although they're Creoles, but they're also inventing a lot of pigments for this particular expedition, for the expedition of the 18th and 19th centuries. And another kind of baffling thing about the 19th century expedition is the sheer amount of time they spend discussing the production of new pigments. Because Linnaeus doesn't like color. Linnaeus thinks color is changeable and untrustworthy. And this expedition, although they're corresponding with Linnaeus, is spending a sh like an insane amount of time producing pigments, <laughs> discussing pigments, coloring things. So, yeah. But in terms of the Nawa production, every color does have a meaning. I don't know if I answered your question. Did I? Okay. <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, when people were collecting these plants, they must have had the help of the indigenous population because those, those are the people who knew the medicinal value of the plant. In the 18th century, you mean? Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, it is... It is true. They sometimes did. They didn't always. In fact, <laughs> Mutis is like very well, um, uh, he's well known for um, discovering chinchona, which is basically a, a plant that helps you fight um, malaria. So it's very important at this time. Uh, but it's all over. And it took him forever to figure it out. Humboldt, when he was there, was like, how is he not mentioning this? The indigenous people in Colombia have been using this plant for malaria. <laughs> so they're just not always also um, sharing all of their information. Um, but also, when we're talking about Creoles, um, some of them are just Spanish-born. A lot of them are mixed race at this point. So the colony has been going on for a while. So these are these the artists... Um, especially working within the the exhibition, are in all um, kind of European white. They 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 have a lot of, of of other cultures as well. And the 16th century one was just produced by by indigenous people. Uh, so all those recipes uh, are in fact indigenous. We actually don't know. I think we've gotten to the point where we know every single plant, um, but it took a really long time. Um, the image doesn't help very much to recognize the plant, and um, the names have sometimes been lost, so it took a while to kind of figure out every plant that they're actually speaking about in this herbal. Yes? Just following up on that, have there been any, have, have people looked, so having figured out what the plants are, have people looked into the recipe? Yes. <laughs> People, um, Mexican scholars are incredible. And this is a book that, um, um, that, um, that although didn't have very much interest, once in 1929 it came back around, there's been a lot of ethnobotany uh, done trying to touch upon this book. Some of them work, some of them don't. We, we, again, we don't know every single one of the plans. And the recipes are not... And not so much a recipe as it says, like, um, for the fatigue of those managing the, this is one I was thinking about, managing the, the republic, you know, and then they'll be like, use these plants. But it's not like telling you how much of each plant you should use. And this book in particular, it was made really, really quickly. And so although it's gorgeous, sometimes you have... Uh, plants illustrated, but they're not mentioned in the recipe, or plants mentioned in the recipe, but they're not illustrated. And so this book is not, it, it, we have a lot of other knowledge about medicinal Mexican recipes that is going to be much better um, than, than, than the Libelus. The Libelus uh, was, was created qu quite quickly, and we do have that knowledge from around the same time. I, I think there's a lot in this book happening. Like, in fact, I think actually that central uh, page would or could have been read as um, as the Garden of Eden, but there's no way um, that Philip II would have read it this way uh, because Philip II doesn't know about Tolan. 
So, so there's, there's a whole series of miscommunications that are happening there. Um, uh, some of it is, is knowledge not being shared. Some of it is it's hard to speak across cultures. And these students could actually very, very well understand both. But I, uh, Philip II couldn't read Nahuatl. <laughs> So it's it's not exactly the same. I think the book accomplished what it needed to do. They did get um um they survived for a little bit longer, but eventually the the school um was destroyed. We only have like 60 years of the school. But they produce within that school three other huge uh, botanical um or books with huge botanical information. Actually, the other two probably have more botanical uh, information than this one. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. That's OK. If you're willing to stay, I'm willing to answer. <laughs> oh, uh, I was going to ask if you think this project is over for you, or are you just scratching the surface? Is this something that you're going to want to keep in the back of your mind if something else comes up or... Oh, right. Well, one of them, uh, with, the, with the 16th century stuff, this is one of four manuscripts that I am presently working on and I'm, I'm kind of editing the book of that. So that, that part of it, I think, is hopefully done. <laughs> and I'm just in the editing part. And that's all in the 16th century. Um, I don't presently have a thought for what to do with flowers. Um, um, having moved here, my interest has sparked again um, in a way that uh, it hadn't when I lived in Aotearoa, and sorry, in New Zealand. I really didn't um, want to engage with their kind of sense of nature because I, I didn't yet understand what had happened in colonial times in Colombia. Um, so it was like, quite a while ago. Now I do, and I feel a little bit more comfortable about opening up and maybe doing some cross-cultural um, connections and seeing what happens um, that is similar or different um, across um, the Pacific and within two different uh, kind of colonial situations. I mean, it wouldn't go as far as the 16th century, but in that, in that kind of Linnaean categorization, it did come and touch, and there have been people that have uh, categorized plants here in a Linnaean way and around the same time. So that might be something that I want to do. do. That would uh, be my next question because I know that uh, I feel, you know, so a lot of, you know, colonization in the Philippines is really big and a lot of our plants and stuff as well. Yeah. I mean, looking at, I was just thinking of all the cross over that you could do if you were interested in um, doing that with other people. Absolutely. Well, with Filipino, it's even uh, easier for me because of the Spanish uh, empire. I, I don't have to learn so much more about kind of at least Spanish colonization. I'd have to learn a lot about um, uh, Filipino uh, people and their relationship to plants, uh, but at least kind of the colonial bit would be very similar. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending Saturday with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.